old brave new world that has such people in it. That's Shakespeare from The Tempest. Why am I giving you that quote, my dear cat lovers? It's because the future is upon us. And with the future, there come certain amazing realities and some stuff that comes with the amazing reality. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about cloning cats and dogs, cloning your animal companion. It can be done. It's being done a lot more than you think it's being done. Can you believe it, folks? We're gonna talk about how it originated, where it is right now, where it's going, and of course, what I think about it. All right, let's get started. So how did animal cloning begin? Of course, the, the science has been around for quite a while. Tadpoles were cloned back in the 1950s, and then mice in the 1980s. And then in the 90s, we had the famous Dolly the Sheep. I don't know if you remember Dolly the Sheep, but she was the first sort of acknowledged, cloned, I mean, she was a sheep. You know, and then in 2005, we had the first cloned dog. Snuppy the dog was the first cloned dog. Now we fast forward to 2017, 2018 is when Barbara Streisand became very famous for, well, she was already famous, but her dogs became famous because she cloned her beloved dog not once but twice. And that set off a whole discussion, a whole lot of debate, um, and a whole lot of people lining up to talk to the company that cloned Barbara's dogs, and that would be Viagen. And Viagen is now acknowledged as the leader in the field. So Viagen actually started cloning uh, livestock and horses as early as 2003. By 2016, they unveiled their uh, pet division. And we know, although numbers can be a little sketchy sometimes when you're trying to collect numbers from the company themselves and outside sources, but we know that over a thousand horses have been cloned and about the equal number of dogs and cats combined. So Viagen is right there in the forefront. That leads us to where we are right now. Viagen is just, I mean, people have lined up. Animal guardians are like, wait a minute, I don't have to say goodbye to the animal I love? Okay, what does it cost? Viagen's like, come on over here. You know what it costs? It costs $35,000 to clone your cat, $50,000 to clone your dog. That's not also including the $1,600 that it costs to just collect a, a skin sample of your animal because that's where the, the skin cells then become the basis of the clone. And then you can freeze it at their facility for $150 a year until you need it. So it's a lot of money, but they're making a lot of money because people are forking out a lot of money. Biogen, Malene Rodriguez, says she's never seen so many people looking to recreate their pets. The phone is ringing off the hook. She says the process starts out with a small skin sample that can be taken from the animal when it's alive and then stored to use later or within five days after a pet dies. Skin cells are biopsied, then it's sent to Viagen where the skin cells are frozen and when you want to start the process, then those skin cells through a very complicated process are fused. They become an egg, which is implanted into a surrogate. Uh, that surrogate then gives birth to clones. Now, is it done on the first try? No, not usually. It's you're usually not gonna get an exact clone with the first pregnancy. Usually it takes a few, uh, and that means a few litters of puppies or kittens, then you get a clone. But genetically identical, physically some variation, but for all intents and purposes, a clone. So with this boom of popularity in cloning, it has also come a backlash. Both the Humane Society of the United States and the ASPCA have come out with statements very vociferously condemning cloning. But that has not stopped a large line of people banging down the door of Viagen to get their companions cloned. Like I said, you guys, the future is upon us. So where does that leave us? Before I go any further, Believe me, I get it. I don't think that there's anybody who has had an animal soulmate 
who has passed, whether by tragic circumstances or just a natural life, the heartbreak that you feel is sometimes more than the heartbreak you feel when a human passes in your life. Just because the love is unconditional. It is nothing but love. There is no, you know, arguments that have tainted your relationship. There are no resentments. There are no things that you said that you didn't apologize for that fester over time. It's just love. It's just a soul connection. And believe me, when I first read this, and I'll, I'll be the first to line up and say it because I know that that's what a lot of you are thinking is, huh, well, really, when it comes down to this, not that much money, I guess, if it means, you know, but there are a lot of ethics involved here. And now that we've unpacked the past and the present, I think it's time to talk about the ethical debates and how that might affect the future of cloning. HSUS put out a statement which in effect said that the commercial cloning uh, was an abuse of humanity's power over the animal world that should be prohibited by law. And the ASPCA called for, quote, a moratorium on the research, promotion, and sale of cloned and bioengineered pets. From their standpoint, yeah, it's an abuse. It's an abuse of the animal world. I mean, don't forget, you are <laughs> calling for donors. You've got dogs that, that may not be these beautiful clone-worthy animals, but they are used for their reproductive system. So Viagen insists that it's gonna be one or two pregnancies, and it's going to be a, an average of one or two puppies or kittens born per litter, and then you'll have your clone. That's basically what they're saying. Now, let's take the case of Snuppy the dog. Snuppy the dog, uh, that was a, a thousand embryos, implanted into 123 surrogates or donors, and that resulted in uh, three successful pregnancies. Only two out of those three actually delivered, and of those two, the only surviving dogs were Snuppy and his twin. Please, you can't candy coat this. The science is not complete yet, and that, and that we don't know uh, about what the numbers are and how many dogs, where do they get these donors or these surrogates? Where are they now? What happens to these guys? And let's now get into, I think, part of what ASPCA, HSUS, and anybody associated with the sheltering world or the rescue world like yours truly. What it means is more animals in the shelter system. I don't care if it's two or three. That's two or three more that, that go into the shelter system for $30,000, by the way, or $50,000. That's money that could be spent to help these places survive. And I, I think that we really, all of us, can take the love that we felt for these animals and maybe transfer that into the love that we can have for another animal that we save from death. All right, that's just one thing. So that is adding to the burden of an overpopulated world anyway, for the sake of trying to replicate that animal that you loved so much. Secondly, we have the unproven nature of this science. Dolly the sheep, our first famously cloned animal, uh, Dolly the sheep died at six years old, which is not the optimum age for a sheep, if you're wondering. And she died of cancer and she died of crippling arthritis, which actually, the, the, the birth of Dolly the sheep actually led to the UN debating this topic for quite a long time, until in 2005, they finally came out with a declaration on human cloning. The declaration prohibited, and I quote, all forms of human cloning in as much as they are incompatible with human dignity and the protection of human life. Uh, the world considers it unacceptable. Snuppy the dog, it, who was a clone of another dog, Snuppy died of the exact same cancer that killed his predecessor at exactly the same age. So just get a hold of this for a second, that that love that you felt that you get to re-experience, you get to also potentially experience the same debilitating, emotionally crippling death again. That gets me upset just to think about that one soulmate of mine that I'm thinking of right now, Rudy the dog, she did not die pretty, man. So imagine if you were Snuppy's human who had to go through it 
all over again. I, a little hyperbolic, I don't know, but they are preying on the grief that you and I feel from losing our animal soulmates. They are promising to have that life back and to have the life that you had together with that animal back again. And that is just, folks, a bill of goods because what, where they'll say that this is an identical twin, and, and by the way, with different breeds, those different breeds have traits, behavioral traits. You know, a terrier will dig, a hound will hunt, and will use their nose to explore the world. But genetically, they're the same animal. You can't tell me that that will be the same animal. That is reductive to the point of, of insinuating that they're machines. Sure, they may have the same sort of tendencies, but let's just say uh, your, your first dog companion lived a pretty full life and you had nothing but a, a beautiful, wonderful journey together. The clone could have a bad experience that you had no power over that some dude with a broom smacked them while they were walking down the street. Now they're afraid of guys, they're afraid of brooms, and it may affect them from a standpoint of post-traumatic stress, which will make them fearful for a good long time. You know, maybe that's the case. Y you didn't, did, did you take your clone to, to Pismo Beach to watch the sunset when they were six and a half years old? Probably not, unless you're really setting your watch. What I'm saying is their genetic makeup might be the same, their breed might be the same, but life is life experiences. To rob us of that notion while promising us a new lease on life is insidious because the only reason that we won't think about all that stuff is because our grief is strong. Our love did not die, but the object of that love did. And that is unfortunately what we signed up for. You know, we know that animals are not going to live the lifespan of most humans. That means that the ferocity of our love that we have for these animals will result in profound grief. But that is also part of a relationship, part of these relationships. Grief then has to be incorporated into our lives. We carry the memory as we carry grief. We carry love as we carry grief. That's the cycle. Messing with that cycle under the guise of, of defying nature, defying what has marked relationships since the beginning of time is, is folly, for lack of a better word. It's just folly. Let me just tell you something. The more that we try to prove through science, and especially by bringing it into the consumer realm, that we are not powerless, increases the chances of us being devastated by our powerlessness. And that's the truth, Ruth. There are certain things in this life that we were powerless over. And the loss of our soulmates is one of them. So clearly that's where I stand. And if that has been ambiguous in any respect, I am saying this, if you love your animals, if you love all animals, don't clone your animals. Say no to these master emotional manipulators, Viagen and whatever company comes after them, and they talk about in all fluffy language, and by the way, I did my own sleuthing into this, wrote to the company, got brochures, got all their stuff, and man, they make themselves out to be Santa Claus. It is insidious, and it is something that we should say no to. It, it, it does not bode well for the future. And it's just not cool from an ethical standpoint, from the standpoint of what is a relationship, from the standpoint of, of creating more animals in a world when we're trying to get them all homes. It's all a no, it's a no, and that's what I think. So what do you think? Let me know in the comments. Light, love, mojo, don't clone. <laughs>